good morning so in the last lecture we looked at uh, boiling as one form of convection heat transfer where there is a change of phase today i want to look at condensation and condensation is basically has many similarities with boiling because this is also a phase change uh, phenomenon but it what we will now look at is what kind of heat transfers uh, can be achieved in condensation or if you're designing an equipment such as a conden such as a condenser for let's say a power plant what goes behind those calculations or those design uh, codes so we know that condensation occurs when you have a temperature of a solid or you bring a uh, solid which has a lower temperature as compared to the saturation temperature of the surrounding vapor so then the vapor can actually condense and uh, you know uh, on the surface the simplest example is if you have a cold uh, bottle that you leave outside in the open you can see that the that the water vapor in the air starts condensing and so you get a film of vapor that start a film of liquid that forms on the colder surface now the dominant form of condensation that we uh, generally work with is uh, one in which a liquid film covers the entire surface and it flows under gravity okay this mode is called as film condensation so in film condensation what we will have is we have a surface which is maybe at some temperature ts which is less than the saturation temperature of the surrounding vapor and uh, a film start of him or rather a liquid film starts forming in on the surface and you have this film just falling under gravity that is film condensation now this film uh, process of film condensation is a characteristic of a clean surface or i would even say an untreated surface on on the other side if or the on the other hand if you have a surface which is uh coated with some special material such as wax or uh, um you know hydrophobic uh, coating in that case what we will see is that the surface which is again at a lower temperature as compared to the uh, surrounding vapor uh so this is vapor here and again let me say the vapor is surrounding this surface what we see is formation of small drops on this surface which is what is called as drop wise condensation this is second mode of condensation where basically you have a coating that inhibits the a sustained formation of a liquid film on the uh, surface now in either case in both cases either it's uh, film condensation or uh, drop wise condensation uh the formation of a liquid film on the surface basically takes away that effective area or some area where the vapor could have come in direct contact with the colder surface so the liquid film or the presence of a liquid on the surface acts as a resistance to heat transfer so there is no direct contact between vapor and the colder surface but because the uh, amount of liquid on the surface is much lower or the you know is much uh, lesser in in drop wise condensation as compared to film condensation or to put it the other way around uh the vapor does see some places some pockets where it can come in direct contact with the colder surface the process of drop wise condensation is much more effective okay the resistance is lower the drop so drop wise condensation is much more effective uh but then there's a problem so drop wise condensation is effective would mean that the h heat transfer coefficient that we get in drop wise condensation would be more than the h we get in film condensation 
but it is inherently challenging to maintain dropwise condensation for extended periods of time. And this basically happens because sometimes the coating that you have put that you have put on the surface to ensure that you get drops that form may wear out. If there's a wax that you put in, the wax may actually wear off, you know, may may uh, may be wiped off from the surface. So dropwise condensation tends to, I mean, when you when you do design something, dropwise condensation may not be uh, as effective in the long run. Or you may not be able to ensure it in the long run. And since the since the film condensation uh, heat transfer coefficient is lower than dropwise condensation, all typically all design calculations consider the formation of film on a surface when we do you know when we're starting out with the, some design analysis. So we don't design condensers based on dropwise condensation, but the traditional way is to design based on film condensation. So what we'll do is we'll look at some physics behind film condensation today. And, uh, you know, we can derive what kind of heat transfer rates or even films that can be formed on a, on a cooler surface. So to begin, we look at lamina film condensation. over a vertical surface or a vertical plate. And you're saying it's laminar. We're starting with laminar analysis because that is where uh, an analytical solution can be obtained. So the geometry is something like, let's say it's something like this. We have a surface. which is a plate which is cooler than the surrounding vapor. So say we have a vapor that surrounds, which is at the saturation temperature. The surface temperature is of course less than the saturation temperature for the vapor to condense. We can define a coordinate system here. So typically we define the coordinates in this manner. So the distance along the plate would be X, the, dis the distance away from the plate in the transverse direction is Y. We'll take gravity acting downwards. And uh, what we know is that at steady state, there would be a film, a continuous film that will form. And we are interested in calculating the properties in this film. So there's a film that is formed. And we want to know what is the thickness of the film, first of all. So at any distance X, say the film thickness is Delta, which I'm going to denote as a function of X, the mass flow rate, I'm going to write as M dot, and we'll see that the mass flow rate will also increase. So M dot X and Delta X will increase with increasing distance along the plate. Uh, what we'll do is to do this analysis, to calculate this film thickness, we will make a few assumptions as well. So the assumptions that we'll make are the following. First of all, we'll assume that, as I said, in the title itself, that the flow is lamina. And we'll assume that the properties are constant, that the fluid properties are not a function of temperature. This would be essential to actually to obtain an analytical solution. The second thing we'll assume is that the gas or the vapor that is surrounding the surface is a, is a pure vapor and at T sat. So as I said, it is at saturation temperature. So basically what I'm saying is that the vapor is not superheated. It is at the saturation temperature. And since it's at, it's a saturation temperature and the vapor is surrounding the surface. So the vapor does not have any temperature gradient because it's everywhere T sat T 
psat is the temperature at all places in the vapor so there is no gradient in the vapor and so heat transfer from the vapor to the film happens at the interface where the vapor comes in contact with the with the liquid film and that is purely because of condensation so heat transfer at the liquid vapor interface happens due to condensation what it means is that the latent heat would be released at the interface and that heat would travel along the or would would basically be transported across uh the the condensate in this case the liquid the third assumption that we we'll make is that the at the liquid vapor interface there is negligible shear stress so du dy at delta which is the thickness or the, the location of the interface is zero that is a way we define negligible this is how we define shear stress so we saying the shear stress is negligible at that location now we expect by the way let me also say this now we expect the temperature and the velocity profiles to be to be developing in a certain way for instance if i had to write uh, define the velocity profile i know it would be zero at the surface and then it would basically increase sorry it would increase in a certain way right so that would be some velocity profile that we should see so this is u of y and if i draw the temperature profile right so that would also be it would start with the low temperature and then maybe go to the high temperature this is p of y so what we'll do is because this the problem gets complicated if we have both variations uh or if we if we unless we make an assumption about advection in the in the condensate it is very difficult to calculate the the uh, the mathematical form of these boundary layers so the fourth assumption that we will make is that we will assume that the velocities are low inside the condensate so in the film we have low velocities what it effectively means is that advection can be neglected the advection terms in the navier stokes will be neglected and uh, transport because of advection both momentum and energy is negligible so we will neglect both you know terms such as u du dx and u dt dx these terms that we see in the in the momentum equation and the energy equation would have uh, would be would be considered small as compared to everything else so the effect of this assumption is that if you just think of the energy equation if the advection terms are zero there is no heat generation inside the film okay and it's steady state it's a steady state problem that we are working with so clearly that means that the diffusion terms are zero and we are also going to use uh, an, you know the analogy such as the boundary layer uh in the case as is in the case of boundary layer when we used uh, when we were working with convection the gradients in the transverse direction are uh, you know uh, some are basically are the only dominant ones and not along the streamwise direction so in this case the only thing that we will left with would be that the temperature terms d to d or rather d to t d y square would be the only non zero or would be the only term left in the uh, energy equation and that itself is zero so d to t d y square becoming zero would basically mean that this temperature variation would now be a linear form so this would be a linear 
temperature variation from T sat to T s. So this is also giving me a linear temperature variation. Finally, once we have these assumptions in place, we can then look at the momentum equation. And in general, the momentum equation will be mu d to u dy square is dp dx minus x, where x is the volumetric body force. That means it is it has units of force for me per, per meter or per uh, unit volume. Now we will apply this equation in both the liquid and the vapor phases because there are two fluids here. Okay, there are two fluids. So this equation needs to be applied in the liquid phase and also in the vapor phase. So we'll start with the vapor phase because that is where things become easy. As I said, the transport, uh, first of all, the entire vapor phase is, is at T sat. And also because there is zero shear stress at the interface that can, that equation basically carries forwards and we can write in terms of y momentum dp uh dx in the in the sorry the x momentum as i should say because x is along the uh, x is along the plate now so dp dx would just be rho v into g That is because du dy in the vapor is zero. And so we can plug this in this form of pressure gradient into this equation and noting that in the liquid phase, we will have mu L D to U by square to be equal to just one second rho V G minus rho L G. Yeah. Somebody had a point. Hello. Hello. Was there a question? Okay. So we'll have the momentum equation in the, in the liquid phase, which would look like this. Now remember that I'm using the subscripts to denote liquid and vapor phases. So you need to understand that it has been applied once in the vapor phase and now it, I'm applying in the liquid phase. So this becomes minus because rho L being more than rho V, we'll just write it at write it in this form. So this is simple. Now we assume the property is a constant. So I can integrate this equation twice and apply boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that the velocity at y is zero, uh, yeah, at y is zero. Sorry, y zero is zero, and the second boundary condition was at du dy at y equal to uh, again delta is zero. So if you apply these boundary conditions, we expect that the velocity profile of force will be parabolic because there's a second order derivative here. And this is, this side is a constant and uh, the velocity profile would be parabolic with it reaching a maximum at the edge of the interface. So at the, at the interface between the liquid and vapor, the velocity will be maximum. So what you should get in this case is that the velocity profile U of Y should be G rho L minus rho V into delta square by mu L into Y by delta minus half Y by delta square. So the purpose of writing it as Y by delta in, in this case is to normalize the coordinate along the along the thickness of the film. So this film thick, this velocity profile can now be used to derive other quantities. Remember, delta is not known. 
delta is is a is a function of position along x we don't know delta yet but we can write velocity in terms in terms of delta now so the mass flow rate per unit width which i'm going to write as gamma of x this is mass flow rate at a distance or at a point x per unit width which we could even think of it as the depth of the plate in that direction but it is more like width because this is a vertical plate so b is a width so this would be just the integral of density velocity and and in infinitesimal element on the plate and so we can also compute this number this comes out to be rho l rho l minus rho v g delta q by 3 times mu l so this is gamma x which is m dot x by b so say i'm just going to store this as equation 1 because i will use this eventually now what we can also do is this was just momentum conservation we can also do an energy conservation or energy balance in the film so energy balance in the film would mean that i could maybe take an element which has a thickness dx and look at what are the different uh energy uh or apply an energy balance on this element so look at what comes in and what goes out in this small element so let's just blow it up here and then draw this that element let's say this is the what the element look like okay so its thickness is dx we already have established that the temperature profile will be linear so let's say the temperature profile in this element and i should be a little careful here so the element temperature profile is a linear variation so this is t of let's say y in terms of just mass flow what we see is that there is some mass coming in here maybe m dot plus dm dot going out the left side is a wall so there is no mass flow across that across that wall and so clearly we have dm dot which is the additional liquid that has been condensed coming from the from the vapor side in terms of energy we know that here we have condensation so dm dot times hfg which is hfg becomes the latent uh the latent heat so that is converted into the energy coming into this element in terms of where this energy is heading okay it it goes through so because the temperature profile is is linear so it goes through as a conduction flux through this layer and then it reaches out from the left side and it's taken away in the it's taken away in the from the by the wall now why do we not have any energy balance from the top and the bottom surfaces that because i said the advection terms are negligible okay and we are not considering any axial conduction because the temperature profile would be self similar as you go along the plate the temperature profile would still just just remain linear so that's a self similar solution so we have only two modes in this case of energy transfer so energy balance would now mean that if i look at this element that the heat flux being removed by the plate by the cold plate should be equal to the latent heat or the latent energy being supplied because of condensation and if i use this now knowing that the flux can also be written in terms of the temperature variation in the in this infinitesimal element so the flux could be written as the in terms of pure conduction 
uh, or in terms of Fourier's law. So T sat minus T S by delta into K L. So now what I can do is combine this, these two equations or rather three equations. Now I have three equations, one, two, and three. I can look at combining these three equations to obtain one equation for delta in terms of everything else that we know about the system. So the way to do it, and I'm just going to do it very uh, quickly here. I can differentiate this equation, equation one with respect to X. So I'll get DM dot DX in terms of D delta DX. Okay. And I can substitute flux here in terms of temperatures and delta here and dm dot dx will then become in terms of d delta dx. So I will actually have one ODE for delta where mass flow rate would be gone. Flux will be gone. It would only be in terms of known properties. So I can take derivative or take dm dot dx from equation one and then combine with equations two and three. By doing so, what I will get is something like this. We will get, we will get delta cube D delta to be T sat minus T S K L mu L D X by Rho L, Rho L minus Rho V into G into HFG. So that's just algebra by rearranging terms in these three equations. So using this, we can then integrate from some distance from the leading edge to some distance X. And I know that the, the leading edge that the thickness of the film would be zero. So we integrate from zero to Delta. So this allows us to calculate the thickness of this condensate. If there was laminar flow at some distance X. So Delta then comes out to be four K L mu L T sat minus T S into X by G Rho L Rho L minus Rho V H F G the whole thing raised to or the fourth root of that or one by four uh, exponent. So that gives us Delta as a function of X. So clearly Delta goes as X to the power one by four. So it grows in that manner. Now what was noticed is that when, the, when Nussel was actually do, doing this analysis, there was something that was noticed that this analysis, because it does not include advection effects, it tends to over predict the film thickness. So Nusselton Rosenau actually refined the latent heat of vaporization where they replace HFG by a new latent heat, which is HFG prime, which accounts for some sensible, uh, cooling component as well. So they said that addition effects can be better taken if you have also sensible, uh, sensible would mean that without facing. So basically any uh, change or any heat transfer because of temperature difference, not just because of phase change. So they modified HFG as HFG plus a constant times the specific heat of the liquid into T sat minus T S. So by doing this advection effects, by the way, this is purely empirical could be better accounted. So what we do is in, in most of these calculations that we'll be doing later, this HFG will be replaced by HFG prime. Okay. Note that HFG is the, is the latent heat at T sat, but we will now replace that with HFG prime, which will also have a variation because of T sat not being equal to T S. 
Further, what we can also do is very similar to all convection problems. We can calculate the Nusselt number and the heat transfer coefficient for this mode. So to calculate the Nusselt number or the heat transfer coefficient, we look at the definition of the flux again. So flux was defined as in terms of Newton's law of cooling is defined as local flux as HX into T sat minus TS. And that we can also write as in this case, we said it is only pure the, the transport of energy is purely because of conduction. So that becomes equal to KL by Delta T sat minus TS. So clearly these two will cancel. And so local heat transfer coefficient would be just KL by Delta. And so we can see that the heat transfer coefficient will decrease as X to the power minus one by four. Getting this now, the average heat transfer coefficient over a distance L, which would be one by L HX DX. You may actually prove that this comes out to be four by three times the local value of the heat transfer coefficient. And that just so happens because X is go X is going as minus one by four or H basically goes as X to the power minus one by four. So when you integrate, you'll get a four by three term in the as a coefficient. And if you want to be more precise, this will be 0.943. So this four by three can be combined with a four here that appears with to the power one by four. So if you take that into account, the expression that you should get is 0.943 into G rho L rho L minus rho V KL cube HFG prime by mu L T sat minus T L into L to the power one by four. That is the expression for the average heat transfer coefficient up to a distance L. And so it becomes quite simple to calculate the Nusselt number, the average value of it, which would just be H bar L into L by K L. And that is just the same coefficient, except now that because we, we divide by K L and multiply by L. So the coefficients here, these will actually invert, will reverse. So we'll have a 0.943 G rho L rho L minus rho V HFG prime into L cube by mu L T sat minus T L into K L one by four. So that is the most, the easiest correlation in condensation that we will use going forward. Now you should note that in this co in this correlation, if I can call it, even though it's an analytically derived solution in this correlation, the uh, properties that we need are the uh, density, the viscosity, the thermal conductivity of the liquid, all these things. And so these should be calculated at the film temperature. So these should be calculated at average of T sat and T S and HFG has to be calculated at, at T sat only because that's how it is defined. So that was laminar condensation out even in in, in as is the case in most uh, fluid mechanics uh, problems, the formation of a film would basically grow as we, as I said, in, as we go along the plate, the, the thickness of the film will keep growing. And so there would be a time when the film no longer remains laminar. And so to define the characteristics of this falling film, we use a Reynolds number. So we define a Reynolds number, which is based on the thickness of the film at some distance X. And it is defined in terms of mass flow rate. So it's defined as four times gamma by mu L. But remember gamma was the mass flow rate per unit depth or per unit width. And so if you plug in some values, we, this would be four rho L UM Delta by mu L 
where u m is the mean velocity at any point or at any location x. So the Reynolds number becomes an indicator for whether the flow will be laminar or, or turbulent and the flow that we expect now here or we see is has different zones or different regimes I should say. So the flow starts off as very nice and clean which is called as we said laminar and this regime is what is called as laminar and wave free zone where the interface between the solid and vapor is is regular it has uh, it is monotonically changing so it is just in the thickness is increasing without the interface showing any any uh, any waves so at some Reynolds number corresponding to re delta corresponding to about 30 we start seeing some wiggles on the on the interface so we'll see some wavy nature on this interface this is still laminar but we will say it is a wavy interface and this behavior happens till about we reach re delta of about 1800 beyond this the surface is irregular which is basically the idea of chaos and then from there on you get a turbulent film. So we have looked at this zone only in this in this class as of now we have only looked at covered this part of the zone which was for uh, the laminar wave free condition for laminar wavy and for turbulent conditions correlations there are other correlations that exist some of them are actually given in the book uh, but i don't think i will ever go in that zone so uh, i have not put them here uh, but they are there in case you are you know doing these calculations you should know that this this data also exists and you can uh, you know you can do this these calculations in the in the other zone in the other regimes as well Further, we have looked at only uh, condensation on a vertical plate. If we had condensation over a maybe a cylinder or even a sphere, if we had condensation around over a cylinder or a sphere, again there are correlations that exist for laminar uh, condensation. The simplest way to write these correlations is that they would be Russell number would be defined in the same way, except this number, which I'm going to call as C, the coefficient C in the cylinder case happens to be 0.729. And in the case of sphere, it happens to be about 0.826. And the other change that you have to make is that you have to replace L in the case in the vertical plate correlation by D in both cases. That is a characteristic length. So if you replace L by D in this correlation and replace this coefficient C by whatever values are given, you can actually obtain the Nusselt number for uh, that geometry. Okay, so uh, I'll stop it here in terms of condensation analysis. Uh, I spent considerable time actually I didn't intend to do it even this into in this depth but still I think for the sake of uh, giving you some flavor I have uh, indulged in uh, going a little deeper into this mode. So what I will do now is an application now of whatever we've learned so far we've learned different modes we've learned conduction convection radiation. Now we look at an application and this application comes in the design of heat exchanges. And we see heat exchanges everywhere around us. And so what is a heat exchanger? It's a heat exchanger is basically a device that facilitates transfer of uh, heat from one fluid to another. Okay, while making sure that they don't mix with each other. So we'll be transferring or we'll be using these devices to transfer heat from one fluid 
to another while ensuring that they don't mix with each other so there would always be a physical barrier between the two fluids and so because there's a physical barrier that means there must be a solid surface that is that separates the two fluids so we'll also have conduction coming into play so in this in design of heat exchangers when we do any analysis we have three fundamental modes that we will work with we will deal with convection in both fluids so we have two modes of convection and then we'll have conduction through the solid which separates the two fluids so when we do analysis we will calculate uh, our resistances accordingly further the heat transfer between the two fluids at any location as i will show you some examples today uh, would depend on the temperature difference between the two fluids and the temperature difference itself becomes a variable it keeps changing from location to location and so that analysis is uh, is slightly slightly tricky but it's not something that we have not covered in fact we have covered one uh, fundamental concept uh, in the past but we'll bring this again especially when we have these variable temperature differences now the simplest type of heat exchanger that i can describe is what is called as a uh, you know which is 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 a device in which you have flow going in two concentric tubes and this is what is called as a double pipe exchanger so there are two concentric tubes in this case and the device would look something like this you have say one fluid coming in here there is a tube which carries a second fluid so there is let's say a hot fluid coming in through the tube and it goes out of the tube here so let's say hot out and say you have let me put it uh, yeah let me change the arrow here let's say there is a cold fluid coming in here and it goes out so what we see is the hot fluid goes here and let me denote the cold fluid by a maybe a, a lighter color let's say blue so the cold fluid moves here so this configuration in which you have the hotter fluid moving in in a in the inner tube and not just hotter it could even be the colder fluid but one fluid moving in the tube in the in the inner tube and the other one in the outer tube in and moving along in the same direction that is the key part that they are moving in the same direction they enter in the same side and then they exit in the same side this is what we will call as a parallel flow heat exchanger and this we will keep using uh, this name will be used quite a few times going forward so this is a parallel flow configuration where the two fluids enter on the same side and leave on the same side the other configuration is and i'm going to cheat here a little bit by taking this whole picture so the other configuration would be one in which we can maybe have the same idea except say we change the direction of the outer fluid say that is the direction we want to change so this time what i will do is i will put the colder fluid in a direction in which it flows opposite to the direction of the hotter fluid so now the hotter fluid or the colder fluid comes in from here goes out here but the hotter fluid comes in the exact opposite direction and so this heat exchanger is what we will call, call as 
काउंटर फ्लो टाइप हीट एक्सचेंज है सो वील सी दीज टू कॉन्फिग्रेशन क्वाइट ऑफन ओके ना in addition to uh, these this classification uh, there is a second uh, set of classification which is defined in terms of uh, the heat transfer area now remember that these two fluids are actually exchanging heat across this area if i can say the circumferential area of the inner tube because that is a uh, area across which heat will be transferred from maybe the hotter fluid to the colder fluid so in terms of area itself and the area and the volume of the heat exchanger we can also have a classification so the classification is based on a parameter which is called as beta which is the ratio of heat transfer area to the volume of the heat exchanger so this parameter beta is called as area density so if beta happens to be more than 700 meter square per meter cube we call this as a compact heat exchanger so a compact heat exchanger is one in which there is a large area for heat transfer per unit volume and how do we attain these large areas and not why is it not commonly found because these are uh, these require special provisions to be created so we typically have corrugations which are typically you can think of it as fins which are attached to the side typically to the side on typically on the side where the where the fluid is a, is a gas and so by increasing this this heat transfer contact area we can actually reduce the resistance on one side and make it make the heat transfer rate more or the heat transfer more effective the simplest example if i bring it again i have done this in the past but i'm going to just bring this again in this class again or in this class is that is the case of a heat is the case of a car radiator so the car radiator here has this configuration so we have a liquid flowing in through the tubes of the heat exchanger but we also have the liquid which is to be cooled but we have these corrugations or these uh, these fins on the surface which ensure that you have a higher heat transfer area between the two uh, fluids now we defined or we, when i said there are i defined two types of heat exchangers which were which were parallel flow and counter flow this doesn't fall in either category because in this what is going on is that the liquid is actually flowing from top to down okay but the fluid the outer fluid which is air is flowing perpendicular to the direction of the flow of the of the liquid okay so they are they are at cross ends to each other so one is going down the other one is going perpendicular to it so in typically in, in compact heat exchange heat exchanges we end up creating this configuration which is called as a cross flow configuration so this is an example of a cross cross flow heat exchanger so the two flu the two fluids are not either parallel to each other or against each other but they are perpendicular to each other okay so there are examples of this cross flow configuration as well for instance uh, there can be two ways in which you can achieve a cross flow type of heat exchanges one is shown here on the left the other one is shown on the right so the left one shows that you have this liquid flowing through the tubes okay the left one shows they have liquid flowing through the tubes here and you have a liquid and a, the outside fluid flows over these tubes except now we have these surfaces that are periodically placed that separate 
the outer fluid. So if you look at a coordinate system, which is X, Y, clearly the fluids, the outer fluid will actually have a temperature, which will be a function of both X and Y because they, it is separated from, from itself in different slots or in different zones. So this configuration is called as an unmixed cross flow configuration. Okay. So this is just to make it bigger. This is an, a cross flow unmixed configuration. The second one in which the fluid is just flowing over the, those tubes and there is no barrier put in place in the other direction. You have temperature only being a function of X only a function of the, the longitude or the, the, the stream wise direction. So this is a cross flow mixed configuration. So cross flow will basically have these two types. Clearly the case of a car radiator is a cross flow unmixed type of heat exchanger. Okay. Think it over why it is. If you're not, you look, look at a car radiator, try and figure out why it's a cross flow unmixed configuration. Now there is another very common type of heat exchanger, which is very uh, prevalent. This is called as a shell and tube heat exchanger. So you will see this exchanger, I would say more often than anything else in, 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 in industry. And this looks, it's a slight more complicated design. So this looks something like this. And let me just explain what I'm showing here. So this shell and tube heat exchanger is one in which you have one liquid, let's say flowing through the tubes of the heat exchanger and the other fluid flowing through the liquid, typically flowing through the surface area, which is outside those tubes. So it goes around those tubes, right? So you can think of a bank of tubes and you have a fluid, which is flowing over that bank of tubes. So there are some features about the shell and tube, which will better explain what, what the design looks like. First of all, there are these longitudinal tubes, many, many tubes, in fact, in a shell and tube heat exchanger. So if I draw the cross section, maybe if I can, uh, it's not to scale, but if I draw the cross section of the shell and tube heat exchanger, you will have many, many tubes, which will be taking the fluid through the cross section. So there are many tubes through which the liquid flows and these large number of tubes, uh, which are packed in this shell, the outer thing is called a shell now, because this is tubes packed in something. So this is, this becomes a shell. So the axis of the, of the tube coincides with the axis of the shell of the shell. Okay. So the tube and the shell have the same axis. Uh, we have some features here. For instance, we have, uh, although I have not labeled it here, uh, these components that I've drawn here in black, these are called as baffles. And the role of these baffles, is to actually increase the heat transfer coefficient on the outer flue on the shell side by increasing turbulence. So the flow has to turn around these zones to start from here. Let's say in this case, uh, let's just look at it one more time. The outer fluid comes in here. It has to flow around these baffles to make its way outside the, or make its way to the out, the outlet port of the shell. The fluid, like the other liquid, which is, let's say in this case, which flows in the tubes comes in here and has to get distributed amongst the different tubes before it flows out. So the baffles are basically ensuring that you have many more turns. So you have much more turbulence created in the flow. And so you have a higher heat transfer. What we also have are these headers. There's a front end header and there is a rear end header. So these headers are basically zones, which are used to accumulate this liquid before it enters into the tubes and before it, uh, or, you know, at the time when it leaves these, uh, tubes. Okay. Now there's a, there's a, there are advantages and disadvantages of using a shell and tube type heat exchanger. Uh, we'll also do some calculations in the, in the tutorial sheet to understand what are the benefits of doing or looking at the design. But one of the things that is very, very should be easily understood by now is that this type of heat exchanger is actually relatively large in size and it's also very bulky. 
it has a considerable weight so it is not suitable for automotive or uh, aerospace applications in aeros in in at least in automotive applications that i've shown now the heat exchanger that we typically use is a cross flow type which is it is compact we can create corrugations because uh, we have we want to decrease the heat transfer resistance on the air side so that there you know in these cases these uh, the, uh, these heat exchangers work better but in industry especially when you go to a power plant you will actually see these kinds of heat exchangers the shell and tube type where you have luxury of space and you can carry a weight shell and tube becomes better okay now shell and tube also have their own classification uh and this lecture is now i'm as i'm hope i mean i can understand it's becoming a lecture on classification of heat exchangers but but please just bear with me for a for a few more minutes now so shell and tube itself has its own classification uh the classification is derived or written in terms of number of times that the tube or the the uh, times a tube makes a u turn inside the shell so this is actually what i've drawn here is a example of one shell pass and one tube pass heat exchanger or one tube pass shell and shell and tube heat exchanger so let me say shell and tube heat exchanger but depending on how many u turns you make you can actually get more variance so for instance let me use a different color for this for instance you have a shell and tube which could look like this so you have a shell and let's say there is a liquid that is flowing through the tubes and it makes one u turn before it leaves so there is one u tube there is one u turn in this heat exchanger so one u turn would mean this is this has two tube passes so this corresponds to two tube passes and so we will call this two tube passes and the shell is the same it's still the fluid just passes through one time it enters a shell and then the next time it exits so this is a one shell pass and two tube passes type of shell and tube heat exchanger but you can actually have a more a much a different variant as well you can have more shell passes and even more tube passes because higher number of passes will ensure that you have a higher area for heat transfer so maybe say we have now one tube pass say this will pass here but now what we'll do is we'll turn this around again and make it pass again so a serpentine type of a design and just to make that the shell i can actually put a barrier between the between the top half and the bottom half so let's say that we have a barrier here in the shell so what this now will do is this has created two u turns for the flow so you have four tube passes and this has because there's a barrier here in the shell you actually have flow going over this side and then go, coming down and then going out so you have two two pass two two shell passes i should say so this is two shell passes and uh, four tube passes and this is just to draw it schematically it doesn't mean that it this is how it is in practice sometimes you can actually have a different shell as well you can have shells in series you know so i'm just trying to show you pictorially what what you can imagine this would look like so that is also one way of classifying these 
heat exchangers. Now, this was a shell and tube type. Now, the last one that I want to introduce because these are modern, these are our mod shell and tube is an old design. A modern heat exchanger would not look like this. Uh, modern ones have uh, more nicer features. So, this is a a modern heat exchanger, which is what is called as a plate heat exchanger. And I'm taking this image from a commercial company. So this is a plate heat exchanger. And in this heat exchanger, what you have is are plates that separate the movement of the fluid. So what you see here is that the liquid, let's say one liquid is entering here in these slots, in these holes, the other liquid is going through these holes. So the yellow, the red uh, denotes uh, in the, in the schematic from the company, the red denotes hotter fluid, the blue denotes colder fluid. And what you have are corrugations. So these features that you see here, these features are actually corrugations. So they are small, small, you can think of them as small channels through which the fluid is going to flow. And so it will trickle down slowly. So it, it spends more time in these corrugations. And uh, the design is such that you have the a specific fluid flowing only in alternate layers. So for instance, the cold fluid flows in this layer. Okay. So this is a cold fluid and it's surrounded by a hot fluid on both sides. So this is H. And this is H. I don't know how, how clearly my uh, things are visible here. So this is H. I said, this is H. And in sandwich between the two is a cold layer. By doing this now, you have effectively increased, maybe, you know, you doubled the area for heat exchange. And so you get very high heat transfer rates. The challenge in this one is that, you know, because the fluid the design is, I cannot spend much time on the design, you know, discussing here, but what I can tell you very quickly is that there are these, uh, gaskets here. Okay. Through which when the fluid flows, the gaskets actually ensure whether the cold fluid goes into the plate or the hotter one. So the hotter fluid, for instance, here actually has a gasket, which denies access to this plate on this side. So this gasket, which is here, which is not completely shown. It denies access for the hotter fluid to go here, but rather it can only go behind where the gasket is missing here on the, on the lower surface. So the hotter fluid flows in from this side, colder fluid flows here. And because they are separated by plates, which have large, which are bringing large heat transfer area, you actually end up getting much more heat transfer. So that is a plate heat exchanger, but there are, because you have these gaskets. So these gaskets can sometimes wear off. And uh, so you can have mixing, you can have leakages. So there are issues associated, associated with this design as well. It is no, no design is perfect anyway. Now, as I was saying, the CC they have, now we have covered sort of the classification of heat exchanges. As I was saying that we would have to deal with convection and conduction as modes of heat transfer for any design analysis. And, uh, the way to do it is if we bring the a very old concept that we covered maybe in the, I don't know, the fifth, sixth lecture or sometime around that. So we covered the concept of overall heat transfer coefficient and we bring this back now. We define U as the overall heat transfer coefficient and it is required for any heat transfer analysis pertaining to heat exchanges. And uh, the way we can deal with, or the way I would describe it is in this form, say we have one fluid and other fluid se separated by a solid, let's say tube, okay, which has some thickness. So say the center is uh, somewhere here. So this radius is, let's say Ri, this radius is Ro. The material has a thermal conductivity, say K, solid, and the outer fluid is at let's say temperature T O and heat transfer coefficient H O the inner one is H I T I. And you want to calculate what is the 
overall heat transfer coefficient for this case. So we know that we can these three resistances are in series. So I can write the the equivalent resistance R for this problem, which would be one by U into A. U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. A is some area associated with the heat transfer coefficient. So this could be either one by U I A I. So heat transfer or rather overall heat transfer coefficient associated with the inner area, or one by U O A O. Which is the heat transfer coefficient associated with the outer area, but this would be sum of three resistances. So one by H I A I plus let's say log of R O by R I two pi L K plus one by H O A O. So we have two convection resistances and one conduction resistance. And so, knowing the heat transfer coefficient, the overall heat transfer coefficient, we could write that the rate of heat transfer taking place would be just U A delta T. And so, that would become the heat transfer uh, applicable for this for a given design of the heat exchanger. Now, frequently we will deal with scenarios, and this is just a simplification. This is not, of course, the case in all heat exchangers, but we will deal with scenarios. Where R I and R O are nearly the same, which means that the that the separation between the two fluids is very small. That the tube has a very thin has a very small thickness. So if R I and R O are same, the wall resistance would be nearly zero. And in which case, I could write one by U as just one by H I plus one by H O, and there is no area because the areas will also be nearly the same. So many of these examples that you might see in your book would actually take this into account or would would start with this assumption, but it need not be. We can also work with the more generalized case. Further, in any heat exchanger with time, because you have flow of fluids, the performance deteriorates. and the performance deteriorates because you have scale formation or you have deposits which which start you know uh, solidifying on the surfaces of the heat exchanger so maybe on the inner surface or the outer surface easiest thing to see is that if you have water flowing in in an, let's say the the tubes of the of the of the heat exchanger then water will actually have dissolved salts which deposit as scale which forms and so because of which the resistance increases the resistance to heat transfer increases and so in those cases where you have fouling of the heat exchanger walls we need to account the fouling resistance and the way to do it would be that we now calculate the equivalent resistance as again 1 by ua which would be 1 by say hi ai plus the fouling resistance associated with the inner surface By A I plus the wall resistance, which is the conduction resistance, plus let's say the fouling resistance associated with the outer surface, plus the convection resistance associated with the outer surface. So these are the fouling resistances which we have covered in conduction, and you should remember that these fouling resistances, the way they we define it. with the double subscript or double superscript which is the the double dash sign it basically denotes that these are meant for a unit area for 1 meter square area if you have a higher area then these resistances decrease and that is the reason i have defined them in terms of or divided them by the area okay Okay, so let me just say a few more words here before I close the class. So we, what we'll do in the next lecture is start with some heat exchanger analysis. But heat exchanger analysis can be done in two ways. We'll do the methods next in the next lecture, but then at least uh, let me tell you what we will what we are more interested in. So we are looking for the cal we are looking at calculating or relating the heat transfer rate. or finding a relation between the heat transfer rate to the temperatures 
at the inlet and exit of these fluids which come into the heat exchanger. But to do this, there are two types of problems that you will encounter in practice. The first problem type is one in which we have to design or let me say choose a heat exchanger which has to achieve say a given a specified delta T or specified temperature change. So specified delta T for each fluid whose and the fluids mass flow rates are also known for each fluid with known mass flow rates. So if I tell you that design this heat exchanger for me in which I want this much temperature change for each of the fluids and I also tell you the mass flow rate that I'm going to be pumping through these uh, heat exchangers, then this first category is done is solved using the LMTD method, which is the log mean temperature difference method. And we looked at it some time back, but now I'll define formally what the LMTD method is. Okay, so, th so this type of exercise is done using LMTD. The second type of problem that you may see is that now I, from the industry standpoint, I give you a heat exchanger. So I have given you a heat exchanger So for a given heat exchanger. So I've given you a design. I've sort, sort of, I picked it out for you that this is the heat exchanger that I want to use. I want you to predict the outlet temperatures of the hot and cold fluids. So now these are not known. I want you to tell me what would be the temperatures for a given design of the heat exchanger. Now this analysis is done using a technique which is called as effectiveness NTU method. NTU as I will tell you is called as number of transfer units. And this is a new method that I will define in the next lecture. So we look at two ways of solving these problems. One method works best. As I said, the first method works best if you want to design from scratch. The second method works best if you are given a design and you have to do some calculations based on that given design. Okay, so, so these will be two uh, types that we will discuss. So I will stop it here. Thank you.